Hi, I'm John Atak, and I'm really honoured to, to welcome Calvin Pierce. Hi, Calvin. Hi, John. It's nice to meet you. It's uh, my pleasure. Likewise. Um, I read your book, um, The Sins of My Father, um, and I think it's a remarkable document. Let me say that from the outset for two oh, reasons. The first is is that it shows the personal life of a neo-Nazi, your father, um, one of the most significant neo-Nazis in the United States. And the second thing, which meant just as much to me, was seeing your own journey, that, that you survived such a, a brutal and awful childhood. Um, you know, you thankfully had a, a loving mother, but, but your father was just an awful brutal tyrant and developed and became aware and as far as i can tell from the book were able to overcome you know the terrible obstacles that were thrown in your way as a child and to become a a fully fledged adult member of of the community and and a man concerned about those around him so both of those things are important to me and I thoroughly recommend the book. Could we perhaps start with, with you telling us who your father was and um, something about that? Um, well, my father was Dr. William Luther Pierce. And so he was the um, founder and um, you know leader of one of the preeminent hate groups in the United States, actually in the world, mm -hmm. uh, the National Alliance. He was basically considered the most dangerous and most influential white supremacist or neo-Nazi in North America for over a 30 year period yeah. by the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Anti-Defamation League. Um, but probably most notably, he was the author of the Turner Diaries, mm -hmm. which was basically to this day is considered the Bible of the racist right um, mm -hmm. here in the United States and all over uh, Europe as well. Yeah. Um, it's handed and, out alongside the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and it was yeah. the book that inspired Timothy McVeigh, wasn't he? He used to sell it at, at uh, gun fairs before the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah, Timothy McVeigh was a huge fan of the book, and he, yeah, he did buy multiple copies, and he would travel all around the country visiting gun shows and selling copies of the book to others. Uh, it was even said that he would often sell the books at less than what he paid for them because he just thought it was so important to get copies of the book out uh, in, in public. And, uh, you know, he did admit that that was uh, what, you know, reading the book and what he read in the book um, inspired him to, you know, commit the bombing in Oklahoma City. And the, the book details... Uh a racist war a racial war yes in which the white it does <laughs> it does i mean it basically tells about a race war in the united states that culminates in the violent overthrow of the u.s government um and you know there was a chapter in the book where a federal building is blown up with a bomb almost identical to the one that mcveigh used um and you know there's a lot of extremely violent racist uh, acts that are committed almost on every page of this book and and the, the attitude and it's the attitude I, I mean i've read too much about nazis and neo-nazis but but the attitude of mine seems to be that um if you don't belong to our group whatever group that is of course hitler would have felt that slavic peoples were just as bad as as any anybody else who was not aryan within his bizarre ideas but if you're not one of us you're vermin you're subhuman you don't deserve rights you know that that is the the attitude of mind among such people um yes it is i mean and that's what i was taught as a child you know i was taught by my father from very early on that you know aryans or the white race were superior that non-whites were inferior and and just like you said even subhuman yeah. And yeah, I I remember often as a young kid in school, you know, looking at non-whites and 
wondering what it must feel like to be subhuman like they must be mm. you know i was just like i was kind of like afraid but i was also fascinated and also you know had a version all at the same time because of what my dad taught me and and you were excluded you were called the nazi kid i think that's the by by some of your school fellows so it there's this terrible other thing in in dealing with members of authoritarian cults, I particularly know about Scientologists, that one of the terrible things is that their children in going to school may well be picked upon because of what the parents believe. So you had a bad time at home, but you also had your problems because of what your father believed at school, yeah? I did. Um, my brother and I did, but you know, for me, it was very personal, of course, but I mean, but there were more than, a few reasons why. I mean, one of the main reasons why was because of the abuse and the emotional and um, psychological neglect and abuse. I was extremely withdrawn as a child. So very shy, very awkward, and of course became a target of bullies and just anybody else out there because I was, I felt isolated. I acted like I was isolated. I felt like I was worthless. I acted like I was worthless. And so that was probably one of the biggest reasons why, you know, I had so much trouble outside of the home. And then once my father started getting a lot of publicity for selling guns, you know, labeling his gun selling as, you know, selling, you know, equipment as, as you know, selling guns as Negro control equipment, things like that. Um, the neighbors took notice very rapidly. And of course, all the neighborhood kids then labeled us as Nazis, mm. became prime target whenever we were outside the house. Mm. And, I, and I think that's an important idea to give to people that, that, you know, showing hatred towards the children of people who are hateful is a mistake, that we should have every sympathy towards, you know, those who've been pulled into a group without their consent or too young to consent. Um, yeah. Okay, you, you're... Your father, it, it's so easy to think that anybody that believes these hateful and dreadful things must be stupid. But as you say, your father had a doctorate. He was a, a professor of physics, yes? Yeah, I mean, he was extremely intelligent. Um, he had a very high IQ. It's like 185, something like that. Very intelligent, you know, very well read, extremely well read. Um, he had a PhD in physics. You know, when his conversion process started, he was a physics professor at Oregon State University. Mm -hmm. And um, he was um, well known for his research that he was conducting um, at Colorado University where he got his doctorate. Mm -hmm. And for the following uh, research that he was doing uh, while he was a professor at Oregon State University, he actually had scientists from all over the world writing to him about his research because it was leading edge stuff. And the whole time he was doing this, he felt like he was superior to everybody else. So he had a hard time working for other people because he never felt like anybody else uh, measured up to him. And so he was not a very easy fellow to be around. No. And I, I, I want to talk a little bit more about about your childhood because you know the for me the the worst point of many bad points in the book many um terrible incidents is is where you found what well, you were six or seven years old and you, you your dad had a razor blade um which was um taped to his chair his armchair so he could take newspaper clippings and being an inquisitive child and and i the way it's described in the book i i really felt i was there it was this sense of yes when i was that old if i would found a razor blade on a chair i too would have cut it and been delighted what with with the effect that it created what happened when your father got home and, and found out you'd done this well he became enraged um, and, you know, I was, I was terrified because I guess after it happened and then I saw my mother's reaction to it, I realized what I had done was 
you know, a bit beyond what my normal curious es escapades were. Um, so, I mean, the first thing he did basically was to tell me to go down to the basement and to remove all of my clothes. And sometimes when he would send me to my room or to another place in preparation for my beating, I would wait there for several agonizing minutes or sometimes it would be hours. And that was kind of like psychological torture in itself because you're standing there alone just waiting for the beating that you know that's going to happen. You just don't know when it's going to happen. Um, but, you know, I think my mom was fully aware of how bad this was and how enraged my father was. So there was a fair bit discussion going on upstairs while I was waiting down in the basement. Um, but eventually my father did come down into uh, the basement and gave me the beating of my life. Um, and I felt like that while that was happening, I had kind of like an out of body experience. I was, you know, I've never been, I've always been afraid of my father, um, but this went to a different level. This was, I, I almost felt like he was going to, he was going to kill me or something. Yeah. So enraged. So, yeah. And, and he would beat you with electrical cable and. Well, you know, he liked to, he liked to vary it. He liked to, to, to change things up. So it, it depends on whatever caught his particular fancy on, on any given day. So he used, uh, electric cords. He used um, belts. He used. Um, he had like this, this very heavy, heavy piece of cardboard that was about the shape of a two by four, yeah. that was used to ship like an appliance or something like that. And he had found it in the trash, and he actually brought it home, showed it to my mom, and he said, "Look, look what I found. This is going to be great for beating the midget with." And because that's what my name was, he only called me Midget. He never called me by my name, Calvin. It was Midget, you know. And um, and he laughed about it. He thought it was funny. And then he put it right next to my bedroom door, and it was there waiting all the time. And so, yeah, I mean, he used various instruments of, uh, you know, torture as as I like to call them. Yeah, I think that's the, the right thing to call them. <clears throat> You're. You have a twin brother, Eric. Yes. And did he, he presumably suffered the same sort of treatment? He sometimes, but not nearly as often as I did. Mm. Well, my brother is a lot smarter than I am. So he, he, he stayed out of trouble, mostly. He kind of flew under the radar. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I've often wondered why I did the things that I did. And I think that maybe subconsciously I was trying to get my dad to notice me yeah. because despite the fact that I was afraid of him, despite the fact that at certain times in my childhood, I would fantasize about his death. I still never ever wanted anything more in life than just to have him acknowledge me mm -hmm. and to love me or tell me that he loved me or that I was okay, but he never did that. And you know, the beatings first started when I was less than two years old. It started like when I was in uh, toilet training. So if I made a mistake, like in toilet training, that's when the beating started. So I think it's possible that maybe a lot of the things I did was a result of the beatings instead of the beatings being a result of what I did. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I was subconsciously acting out. I'm not sure. Mm. I mean, and, and what you say, of course, we, we have a profound need to be approved by our parents as, as children, and um, which continues in, in, into adulthood, the, the idea that it does. It that does. You're, you're good enough, you know, that, um, but in, in your case, uh, you had a father, you know, there was no pleasing him. You talk about a, an incident involving, you know, you say that, that the one thing he did love were, were were they two Siamese cats or? Well, we had several Siamese cats, several. Um, several. Um, there were two in particular. Well, there were three in particular, the first three that they had. So the first one they had was uh, Buckwheat. And he got that cat as a kitten for my mom when she was pregnant with my brother and I. And then fairly shortly after that, 
a, another Siamese appeared in their neighborhood and seemed to be uh, homeless and was very um, uh, mal malnourished or whatever. And so they took it in. And that was um, Bestus because he was a, a blue point. So he kind of looked like asbestos. So they named him Bestus. Okay. Uh, buckwheat was a seal point, which is dark brown, hence the name buckwheat. And then they had a litter of kittens and they kept one of them. And that was another seal point, And that was George. And those were the first three Siamese cats. And those are the ones that my mom and, and my father just adored. Huh. And, yeah, but there were many more after that. And isn't there a point where, where your father actually kills one of the cats? He did kill Buckwheat yeah. Buck, when she was older. And this is when I was um, a young teenager, um, you know, became ill. And um, it was like a thyroid condition. So she was supposed to take pills every day. And on the like the first or second try of giving Buckwheat a pill, um, Buckwheat kind of fought back and bit my father. Mm -hmm. And father flew into a rage and picked Buckwheat up and threw her into a wall and, you know, busted up a lot of her insides. And it took her about three or four days to die. Mm -hmm. um, but it was horrible. And my mom was just devastated. Uh, she just cried and cried and cried. And, uh, you know, I'm sure my father regretted it. You know, he had a temper, so he didn't like think these things out. It was an instantaneous reaction of rage. He carried a lot of rage inside of him. Yeah. Um, so things, if, if he got, you know, ticked off or something, you know, incited him, uh, that temper would come to the surface in an instant. And yeah. I think that Buckwheat was just, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time and, and literally it just happened in a second i mean anybody who's tried to put a pill down a cat's throat knows that it's not something yeah. they enjoy no it's not it's not easy <laughs> oh dear okay there was actually um something you, you say in the book that that um i'd like to read out because i i thought it was a very um useful um, an inspiring statement. It's right at the beginning of the book in the preface. Um, you say, I want people to know that they can choose which thoughts in their heads to listen to, sorry, that they listen to, and that their hatred of others is just a temporary adrenaline fix, like a drug that makes you feel better about yourself and your lack of self-worth, but only for a short time. And it it makes me think about your father and that, you know, that's what made me think about at this point, the adrenaline fix, that he was somebody who was intolerant of people. He considered himself to be more intelligent than other people. And he was isolated. And it, it, it seemed, you know, and it may be generally true that people who thrive on hate and, and who are driven towards the destruction of others and towards you know collecting instruments with which to beat their children that that this is some sort of um it's a mental disorder it, it's a there's something badly wrong with your father that you know we might look at him and, and it'd be quite easy to classify him as a psychopath um, somebody with the antisocial personality disorder. But is there any point at which anybody sought to alert him to his own mental condition that you know of? Um, um, well, I mean, I know that his brother, you know, his brother told me that he was aware of, to a certain degree, of how he treated my brother and I. Mm -hmm. And he kind of pushed back on him and and I, I asked my uncle, I said, well, you know, were you aware of this? He said, yes. And I, I did try to talk to your father to it, but he completely shut me off and said it was none of my business. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I agree with you. I, I, I know that hate is a disease. You know, hate is a mental disease. It's, 
it's the product of a deluded mind. And um, I also know that if you really feel good about yourself, you really feel worthy and you love yourself, that you're not really capable of hating others. So I think that deep down, even though people don't consciously know it or are aware of it, that if they hate others, then there's some serious, you know, self-worth, self-esteem, self-loathing issues going on within that person. Um, and, you know, to a certain degree, I'm not always, of course, but, you know, I believe it's, it's a choice, you know, it's a choice that, that you make and that if we want to, and we have the discipline that we can learn to make a better choice. And I think the book shows that you exemplify that choice, that you are somebody who you're, you're in dreadful circumstances throughout your childhood. And uh, Eric Fromm talks, he, he blames Nazism in his book, Escape from Freedom, you know, having escaped from Germany and gone to America. He is trying to understand how Nazism could possibly have taken over in, in such a civilized, highly educated place. And he says that he's come to the conclusion that there are people who do not form a self. They have a pseudo self. They depend upon what other people think about them. The, you know, the reflection, are they doing the things that fulfill other people's needs? And I think that that self-love that you're talking about, that sense of self-worth comes from growing up, becoming an adult, becoming responsible and developing your own tastes and attitudes. And <clears throat> so many people seem to be consumed by the notion of revenge, that, that they're somehow <clears throat> excuse me, paying back some affront that has occurred to them. And your dad seems to have been just caught up in that all the time. <coughs> He's going to get his own back, you know? Yeah. I mean, I personally, I don't think my dad had a real sense of, uh, you know, good self-esteem or self-worth. Um, I mean, because there were a lot of things that he said about himself. He felt like he had very poor discipline. He blamed his parents for it. That's one of the excuses he would give to my mom on why he treated, you know, me and, and my brother the way he did was that he didn't want to make those mistakes that his parents made and in not instilling strict sense of discipline into his sons. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think there's also just, just like uh, what you were saying earlier, I think some people have a very strong sense of self, but when they don't, they kind of they kind of grab onto like a collective consciousness. So that's kind of probably what was happening in Germany, you know, because there was a, a lot of um, talk and publicity and um, you know, really bad feeling uh, in the collective consciousness of Germany about what happened during World War I and what happened after World War I. And then, you know, Hitler took advantage of that and he whipped that up. And so people that were suffering, that were going through the depression, that had no sense of hope or anything like that, it's really easy to blame it on the other. And, yeah. you, know, you know, if anything's going wrong in your life, in your life, instead of looking inside and trying to take responsibility and say, well, why do I really feel this way? They would prefer to say, the other is making me feel this way. The other is responsible. Mm -hmm. And that's how people like Hitler and other, you know, get power and maintain power as they whip up that sense of, of hopelessness and they, you know, pick a group and they label it as the other, and then they say the other is responsible for all your ills, and what we need to do is get rid of the other. Yeah. And Hitler was a master at that. Yes, and surrounded by a, a bizarre clique of people who, who you know, looking at um, Goebbels and the, the, in, the incredible control that they had because radio that period was a very controllable medium you could block incoming signals so that all it was going through i mean i wonder at the moment in russia 
you know, given that the I think internet's Putin still is open. following a very similar playbook. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, your father became um, a disciple of George Lincoln Rockwell in the early 60s. Is that right? Yes. So that was his first, well, not his first, but it was his first probably major foray into the world of hate. His very first attempt was to join the John Birch Society when he was in Oregon. But he quickly became disillusioned with that because they would not express any form of outward anti-Semitism. Mm. And he wrote to the, the founder and the leader of the John Birch Society and suggested that you know, the Jews were responsible for everything that was bad and that they needed to take that up as a cause. You know, he refused, so my dad quit. And then he saw Link, George Lincoln Rockwell speaking on TV. And he, he liked what he heard, so he wrote him a letter. And Rockwell wrote him back right away. And then they exchanged a few more letters. And then my father told my mother that he was going to the East Coast for a physics conference, but instead he was going because he wanted to meet Rockwell in person. Mm -hmm. And so he met Rockwell in person and they had several lengthy discussions. And then he came back to Oregon and he basically told my mom he was quitting his job and moving to the East Coast so he could be closer to Rockwell and start writing articles for him. And they basically told my mom, you can come if you want. I don't really care. It's up to you. And she said that, you know, she thought about leaving him at that point, but she was terrified at the idea of trying to raise two, you know, four-year-old boys, you know, by herself. Yeah. So she, um, she followed him, you know, to the East Coast. And he also gave up earning money at that point, didn't he? That, that your mom... Well, he, well, his very first attempt on the east coast was he took a job with pratt and whitney in connecticut but that only lasted one year and um you know he would drive from connecticut to northern virginia on weekends to spend time with rockwell and to write articles and stuff but he got quickly disillusioned with working for people at pratt and whitney he said they were all idiots and they you know they were way below him and you know, how could he possibly take direction from them? Um, so he quit his job and that's when he stopped earning any money at that point. And um, my mom was basically like, what are we going to do for money? Because she hadn't really worked other than doing typing jobs or anything like that. And his response to her was, I don't care what you do. And so she became desperate and she immediately, you know, gathered me and, 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 um, my brother and she went to uh, California. She dropped us off with her parents. She went back to school for several months. She finished her master's degree because she was working on her master's degree in Oregon when, you know, dad quit and moved. And then she got a job at Mary Washington College as a mathematics professor. And she stayed there doing that job until, um, you know, my brother and I were grown up and out of the house. Mm -hmm. And that the only income that we had uh, from that day forward. So that that would have been that's more than a dozen years, isn't it? That that you would have been about five when when you were dropped off with. And yeah, it, yeah, that's correct. Um, it 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 didn't always interests me how people um, how they identify. So uh, a friend of mine was, was doing a, a thesis um, for a psychology degree, and he was from Northern Ireland, and, and he asked people here in England what they considered them, you know, who they were. And they would tend to say the jobs they did, that they identified, you know, I'm a carpenter, I'm a what have you. In Northern Ireland, almost exclusively, people said, I'm British, that their identity was a national and of course they aren't. Northern Ireland is not a part of Great Britain. We are the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But I understand, you know, they were people who, who the most important thing, thing to them in their identity was this sense of nation, belonging to a nation. I have the sense that, that your father's identity, most unusually, excluded your mother and excluded you and Eric because his identity was a kind of imagined political community that he was part of. So it was more important to him to pursue those 
aims than to support it and maintain his own family. And yes, absolutely. I mean, he, I mean, in a way, he considered himself, you know, like like a Superman. Like it was his job to, you know, force the next evolutionary step in the, you know, Aryan human being mm. and to get that um, evolution to bring us white people to, you know, the super race, mm. you know, kind of, I guess, like some of the things that Hitler was trying to do during World War II with his, you know, research of super Aryans or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, but it was, it was, that's what he considered himself. And he was definitely, um, you know, considered that, you know, the, the white or the Aryan race that evolved from the Northern European continent were the true um, inheritors of the earth, the true master race and it was his job to save the white race and anything else was inconsequential and was to be sacrificed and i remember asking him i was i guess maybe 20 years old and i was you know trying to get a normal father-son relationship going you know, I only saw him a couple of times a year, but I actually drove into Arlington to visit him in his office. I wanted to introduce him to my fiance. And I asked him, I said, Dad, why did you do what you did? You know, and in my mind, I was asking him, how could you turn away from your family at such a young age and turn toward hate for the rest of your life? How could you do that? You know, and I could see that he was actually thinking about it. And then he just turned and looked at me and said, I did the only responsible thing I could do. Mm. And that was it. That was the only answer I got. Incredible. I, I mean, to touch on the, the Aryan theme, um, I did some work on this last year, um, some, some research towards a, an article. And as far as I can tell, the idea of Aryanism comes from Helena Blavatsky who in the 1870s, you, you, scientifically, you had the idea of an Indo-European people who had, were the beginning of, and that was coming out of language studies and that was good academic work. But Helena Blavatsky came up with this idea that the Aryans were the people of Atlantis, that they had superpowers. And the guys who developed this idea were two Austrians called Lenz and Liszt, who, Put for the, and this is a time when pan-Slavism is going on in Austria and they're all the nationalist movements, everything is pulling apart. And they put forward the idea that these Aryans who had interbred with the Lemurians had lost their supernatural powers. In their literature, they call them electron powers because the word electron had just come into the language, so it sounded very sciencey, I guess. And that when Himmler set up the Ananab, Within it, you had the Lebensborn. The, you know, the, the Ardenab itself was a ministry with 50 departments researching all sorts of bizarre and weird ideas to try and prove that there really was this genetic stock, the Aryan people, who, as I said before, would not include any of the Slavic people. So anybody who's in the neo-Nazis thinking that because they have a white skin, they are therefore Aryan. I'm afraid this is, is not so. Um, no, I, go, I, know. I know that, yep. <laughs> so with the Lebensborn, what Himmler was trying to do was, was to breed people with superpowers. And it sounds, I mean, you, the, thing, the thing that you don't give any detail about, which fascinates me, is his, what was it called? The Church of the Cosmo Creator and Cosmotheism. What sort of ideas did he have about that, you know that came so he's basically just as the nazis were i think it's a mistake to think of the nazis as a purely political movement they were a religious cult you know they they had all sorts of bizarre beliefs that, that they were yeah there. yeah i mean my dad you know formed the the cosmotheist church for you know his compound out in west virginia i mean he was trying to create 
a community uh, of, um, you know, for white people to come to and to live there and commune. And he knew it was important that there be some sort of faith, you know, some sort of faith system involved in a community. So he basically kind of invented this cosmotheist religious idea, which was based on the cosmos, you know, the, the universe and, you know, the scientific um, explanation for the universe and for life and, you know, um, and also a connection to the land um, and to, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, purity through working the land and living off the land and, um, you know, making it on your own and if the community could come together and work really hard and be okay and survive and not need to rely on anything on the outside. Mm, independence. And, and what, how, how big a following did he have? Um, not, not big. I mean, he had, you know, I think at, at the most he ever had was maybe 1500 dues paying members, but he had, you know, a, a, a slew of, what I would call closet Nazis. You know, these were people who would secretly support him, and would occasionally send some money or, you know, send in a nice letter, or want some of his literature, or buy some of his books, but they didn't want to be on a membership list. They didn't want anybody in the public to know that they were racist and they kept it to themselves and they didn't talk to their friends about it unless they knew it was safe. Um, so it, it never was really big. Hmm. You know, the biggest thing that really happened in his entire career was, you know, 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah. Because of the publicity that that got and then the Turner Diaries got, that was a huge boon for the National Alliance because all of a sudden, you know, my dad was being interviewed on 60 Minutes, you know, news people were wanting to talk to him. And uh, people were starting to take much greater notice of the Turner Diaries. Uh, donations were coming in. And then of course he brought in a little bit more talent and then he started selling more books. And then he started the Resistance Records, which was he bought a music label of you know skinhead, uh, white power kind of um, uh, music. And um, that was a huge money maker. And, um, but when it came down to basic dues paying members, he never had that many. Before 1995, in the in the, you know, during the late 70s, early 80s and stuff, he was barely surviving. Hmm. I, I mean, he seems to have had a, a flair for publicity. He perhaps because he despised the majority of humanity, you know, the you're reading about resistance records and the thought of this relatively old man now picking up, you know, screaming white heavy metal bands um, it is very strange. But he was also there was a publication called The Saga of White Will it is in, you know, in the attempt to, to recruit young people. Yeah, with, that was like a comic book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and with the Internet, he, he became active there now. He really didn't get very far, as you say, 1,500 dues paying members is not that impressive. But what has happened since is that this, you know, in the same way that, you know, the Nazis, uh, Hitler was the 55th member of, of the Nazi party. That's how big it was. Um, and it, but something can happen overnight. And we've, of course, in the last, 20 years or so, 25 years really since the Oklahoma City bombings, we've seen the, the right grow enormously. We've seen the return of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, we've seen the alt-right, so-called. And we're now seeing a, this kind of attempt to sanitize. So, so when they make hateful jokes, they'll say they're being ironic. Or you know they'll you know they, they'll get into and watching uh, documentaries, watching video of people in this 
community now, your father left behind a tremendous influence. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. And, you know, even during his heyday in the National Alliance, there were many, many other hate groups out there that he coordinated with, you know, Aryan nations and things like that. Um, and that they would come and join, you know, conferences and they would do cookouts together, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I think probably the biggest thing that happened, at least in my country in, in the United States was, you know, what happened in 2016. Yeah. Uh, I think that the way that campaign was run, the things that were said, you know, basically told a lot of people in our country that being outwardly racist was not bad anymore. It wasn't something that you, you know, kept below the surface. It was okay to let it out, that it was now becoming unassailable to, to express your hatred of the other out in public. And um, I think that was used as a tool. And it, it was like, you know, kicking over a can of gasoline on a fire. Yes. You um, know, the racism was always there, but it yeah. was more latent before 2016 in our country. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just like ready to blow because, you know, I think one of the most inciting things that ever happened in our country was the election of Barack Obama as our president. Mm -hmm. I think there were so many people who never considered themselves racist, they were outraged that they had a black man as their president. And I think that outrage just built and built and built. And then in 2016, somebody took full advantage of that and just lit the fuse. And it just, it changed our country. Yeah. And I think it changed the world as, as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I've, I've watched it with horror. As, as soon as he announced candidacy, <laughs> I became fascinated because he is, you know, doing the work I do this last 40 years where I'm dealing with people who have been preyed upon by authoritarians, um, by human predators, and seeing some, someone who so obviously had a contempt for the truth and who was a bully, you know, who basically would just shout people down and seemed to have just two modes, one of which was, I think everybody will be very happy with what we do. And there are, that's something that he would say at the end of almost every statement, going right back to interviews he gave in his 20s. Everybody will be very happy with what we do. And then if somebody gave ventured the slightest criticism of him, there'd be a rabid ad hominem attack against that person. You know, he'd just dig right into them. And sitting on the other side of the Atlantic, so it doesn't, I mean, it directly affects all of us who is the president of the United States, is, you know, probably still the most powerful person in the world. But to see this man who was such a fake, you know, who looking at his whole history, going back to the, you know, the money he got to build the Commodore or the, the, building three casinos in the same place. So they're competing with each other and then claiming to be a brilliant businessman as it went bankrupt, that he seemed to be such an evident fraud that, that it, it seemed impossible to believe that people would vote for him. And the Republican Party believed that too. And then, and there was so much talk before he was given the nomination that they wouldn't let him in. And now we seem to be in a, a situation where you have the Democrats with many failings. And on the other hand, you have the party of Trump. You don't have, you know, with John McCain gone and there's just Mitt, Mitt Romney there. To, they seem to be falling in behind him. And the idea that the electorate could be stirred up with all of this racism and all of this hatred, all of this idea of exactly that sense, we've been victimized. We in the Rust Belt have been victimized by these things have been done by the Democrats suddenly. So an enemy is, is named. And rather than, you know, by now, he should surely have been prosecuted, given 
you know, just looking at his tax returns and the the, the fact that, that that he's apparently not made any money for the last 20 years and yet is a billionaire. I have a problem with that. You know, how do you have those sort of resources? The attempt to uh, smear Hunter Biden through Ukraine, these things just from the outside. But when you get onto the inside, the kind of QAnon, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, all of these groups who are looking for a leader, they're looking for somebody to you know, release them from all of the problems of the world. And here is this figure. Um, and in a, you know, the US now seems more divided than it has done, well, certainly since the civil rights movement in the 50s. You know, it, it seems that, you know, the, the Confederate battle flag is, is now back on display again, but it, it, no lo it, it very definitely is a racist statement. Um, it is, and it's, um, it's extremely symbolic of how ill our society is right now. Yeah. You know, I personally think that it's a direct reflection of, you know, how corrupt um, our government is. You know, our, our system of government is incredibly corrupt. I mean, it's basically run by the rich for the rich. Yes. And I think that it's, um, you know, symbolic of, you know, everything that's going wrong um, in our world, you know, just the massive income inequality, you know, the corporate greed that's out there, um, a government that's being bought by the ultra rich, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's like that everywhere. And, you know, when you, you run that kind of a momentum for long enough, you know, people lose hope. And then they see a man, you know, because they feel so bad and they feel so hopeless, they're not grounded. They're not using their intuition. They're not believing what their eyes are really telling them. Because anybody that's grounded and is intuitive and is aware would see right through this man. I mean, it was instantaneous for, for a lot of people. But other people are like, this guy hates the same thing that I hate. Therefore, I'm going to support him. And that was their only reason. And everything else that was being done, all the lies, all the, you know, vicious attacks and all the corruption, that was all okay. Because this guy's on my side. He has to be on my side because he hates the same things that I hate. And that was enough justification. And um, it's, it's a very, very sad reflection on how incredibly ill our society is right now. And I'm very concerned. Yeah, me too. And, and I agree with you. I think plutocracy, the rule of the rich, is the problem. I think it's, to some extent, always been the problem. Um, yes. And the, the, there, there is this kind of black and white thinking, that, the idea that if you don't agree with that, then you're a communist. <laughs> you know? And <laughs> the, the thought that we could have actual democracy rather than having a cacocracy, the rule of the worst, which is what yes. we've had. And it, yes. looking around the world today, you know, uh, Bolsonaro, Duterte, Modi, Abe, uh, Scott Morrison, Boris Johnson here. It's a dreadful crop of people. Um, looking at the, the banking crash in 2008, that that came about because of political maneuvering and it still hasn't been reformed. It's still happening. Subprimes are being sold again. And what happened was that the bankers were bailed out, paid themselves huge bonuses and retained their power. So the sense of uh, uh, Naomi Klein said that um, when Reagan came to power, the average CEO of, of the company would, would earn about 40 times what a blue collar worker would, would be earning on the shop floor. Uh, by 2000, when she was writing, they would earn 411 times. And we're now seeing, you know, the idea that Elon Musk has just forked out $44,000 million of his own money to buy Twitter, that anybody can be that obscenely rich, 
you know, it kind of makes me think about, you know, some squirrel collecting nuts for the winter and they've collected enough nuts to live for 50,000 years while all the squirrels around are starving. And to get that balance back, to, to, to get a society that cares for other people, that, that is pro-social instead of this grab it and run idea that we, we seem to be running with. But what you say is, isn't it incredibly ironic that plutocracy is the problem and Donald Trump who's a billionaire, comes along and says, hey, vote for me, I'll deal with the plutocracy. I will drain the swamp, you know, and we find ourselves no further on. You know, we, we um, and who knows what will happen, you know, this November, we're all kind of a little bit worried about what's going to happen in Congress and whether that signals that either Donald Trump will return or maybe Ivanka Trump will be the next president. You know, at least it'd be the first woman and the first Jew to be a president but you know I'm not all that keen on on her past past track you know um yeah I, I mean so many things that your father did that the uh, video game the ethnic cleansing video game <laughs> um and as you say he was selling weapons of guns for use for as negro negro control equipment um it's it, it, it's just it's just an amazing just an amazing situation so um i i'm very grateful that you've shared your time with me i've i've found it very informative and um i might well come back and and ask to talk to you again anytime john it's been my pleasure it's really um, great to meet you great it's been a, it's been a, a thorough pleasure to meet you too calvin okay so Thanks to everybody for, for watching and um, please uh, put a dollar in the box with Patreon for us so that we can keep running. And my guest is uh, Calvin Pierce. His book, The Sins of My Father, is a really important read. Um, as I said, it said before, partly because it portrays one of the most significant um, right wing figures of the generation but more so because it shows a, a journey towards humanity in your own case, that you were able to overcome th those, you know, the terrible times of your childhood and grow into a, a good and decent human being. So um, it, it's been wonderful talking with you and uh, hopefully Thank we'll talk you. again soon. My pleasure. Thank you take care. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.